Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a great day. So today's going to be my January reading wrap up and I sort of like talked about it a bit on Instagram how I've just been really really stressed about making this video and it's super super irrational because there's like no reason why I made so m I made this m number of wrap ups before and all of a sudden now I I'm like having so many anxious thoughts about this wrap up and it just makes no sense. No sense whatsoever. Maybe it's like the fact that I've just realized that I'm actually putting myself out on the internet and I'm actually not that good about talking about books and realizing that I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I will be keeping this like oven on, I'm gonna warm my bum Hopefully this mic is gonna eliminate some of the background noise, but you never know. So yeah, I've made a whole separate video for the graphic novels and comics I read in January, and so you can check out that in the cards. Other than that, someone made a fan, out, a fan art drawing, or a fan art, I don't know, a drawing of me. I'll answer that here, which is super, super cool. I love this art style. Dora, it's the first ever person who's drawn me, except myself, obviously. And that was a fun time, so. If you want to draw me, tag me. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, these are the books I'm going to talk about today. There's some I don't have physically, obviously, but let's just get started. I was thinking of dividing it up into nonfiction and fiction because some of the books, like, I feel like relate to each other, but we're just going to have to start. So the first book that I read, I listened to it on audiobook, is why I no longer talk about, uh, talk, why I have no, see, I just can't do anything. I'm so hard on myself. Give yourself a break, Will. Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race by Remy Edo Lodge. I listened to this on audiobook. I sped through it and I sped through it, but I listened to it during one day. I cleaned my entire apartment and I just listened to it. And honestly, I didn't love it. Like, obviously, all the points that Lodge makes in this, Edo Lodge makes in this, are valid, fair, completely correct, but it's very, 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 very basic. This is like, if you've never read anything about racism, if you pretty much have never even thought about it, you could read this book, but honestly, I felt like it wasn't, it was a bit too basic for me because I want to like dig deeper, um, but I'm grateful this book exists. I bought it many, many, many months ago, I'm glad I finally got to it and the audiobook is fantastic, but it led me to read Thick because I wanted to read more books on racism that maybe one was a bit more personal and second delved in more into the feminist part of it because this my favorite parts of this one was the intersectionality with feminism and also the interviews she, she did with racists. I felt like that was enlightening, but this was just amazing, fantastic five stars. This is by Tessie McMillan Cotton, Cotton and Cotton, Cotton. I also listened to this as an audiobook, but I needed to get a physical copy. Like so many of the um, nonfiction that I read this month was just fantastic. So I wanted to read them all um, in physical format as well. But I don't know if I'm going to get to all of them because they're also really, really good. And I'm excited about that. But this is almost, it's just a collection of essays that are personal and not personal when it comes to uh, Cotton's experience with racism, being a woman in America, a black woman in America. I thought this was fantastic and I felt like I learned a lot from it, but it was also quite personal. I think the introduction or the first chapter didn't really resonate with me and it was very repetitive and I was like, ooh, this doesn't have a good start. But then I got really into it and I found particularly the parts that were the most interesting were her, when she's talking about her own experience with pregnancy and her experience with hospitalization, is that what it's called? When you go to the hospital and a hospitalization, that's something different. And her treatment there, I found that was shocking. Like I know it happens, uh, but just hearing about also the statistics of how much worse it is for black women uh, going to the hospital to give birth versus white women was, I knew it was a problem, but I didn't know it was this bad. So that was very enlightening and I liked it. I highly recommend it. Put them there. Then I picked up uh, another nonfiction. This is uh, Greta Thunberg's like little book. This one's quite famous. I'm a big fan of Greta. I think she is very inspiring and I know that, I mean, she got a lot of publicity probably because she's from Sweden, but I know kids all around the world are demonstrating in different ways 
this was good, but let me tell you, I feel like there's a lot of people who care. I'm gonna put my leg up here. Um, I feel like there's a lot of people who care about the environment. They're like, ooh, I'm gonna read this tiny book by Greta Thunberg because it's so easy to fly through and that's the effort I'm gonna make. I don't recommend this because these are just a collection of all her speeches and you can literally watch every single one of them on YouTube. So this book is a bit pointless. Honestly, I feel like I could read one of her speeches every morning just to motivate me, but I just find like this is sort of pointless and she says it also in her speeches that like, why do you need me to tell you to listen to like the thousands of scientists that tell you that climate change is a problem, listen to them and listen to their statistics. And that's completely true because that's why I'm reading their books and I'm reading other people and adults who've done research because she's a child at the end of the day and I... I like this because she's so black and white in her views and I agree and I love that but she's not the voice to listen to when it comes to this sort of things because she's just an activist um, and I mean all people even scientists are activists in many ways but it's a different sort of writing and professionalism and level of education I don't want to be like I mean obviously you don't have to be educated to be a great activist and write a great book but do you know what I mean? I hope that's not offensive to anyone. Um, so yeah, I don't recommend this. I have a mul multiple, multiple climate fiction books that I recommend before this. And also it's a lot of money for pretty much nothing. But she says a lot of great stuff, obviously. After that, I picked up In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Mercado. I tabbed like this a lot. This was good. It's definitely written in like a very interesting way. So it's a memoir, queer memoir, that follows Mikado as she enters this abusive relationship and how it evolves. And every chapter is pretty short and it's written like, uh, let me see, a dream house, a stoner comedy, dream house as mad versus nature. And then it's like all these chapters. I think what was really important about this one is the connection between queerness and villainy and how it's presented in the media like pretty much all of the disney um villains are queer <laughs> pretty much and how that uh, affects us but also how we love to love that part of them uh, i really like that chapter and i also liked how the correlation between how men hitting their wife is a sexist act uh, the correlation between that to women hitting women is homophobic um, and I found that really interesting and I feel like that's like the a part of it that was explored. I gave this four stars. It didn't emotionally affect me that much but I think it's beautifully written. It's uniquely written and I'm super super glad I read it and I uh, recommend you check it out. It was such a worthy read and yeah I was in an abusive relationship for three years so I've sort of already been through this and that's why I think I would have reacted emotionally harder, uh, but maybe that just means I worked through it. I don't know. <laughs> After that, I picked up a short story collection. This is People From My Neighborhood by Hirumi Kawakami. So this was fun. This was a fun time. It's written like these short stories uh, that take place in this one little town. It's super speculative, weird, sci-fi, really, really enjoyed it and recommend it if you're into that kind of stuff. I didn't like, it's not a new favorite. I gave it, oh, I gave it three stars. I feel like I should have gotten given it higher. There was some really clever stuff. There's, for example, one in here that where gravity becomes reversed um, for like a certain amount of time and all this like weird stuff that happens in this town. It's all seen as like super normal. And they're all connected, even though they're short stories. So like, you definitely have to read them in order. <laughs> it just follows like a bunch of weird characters in her town. And I really liked it. I highly recommend this if you're into speculative short stories. It really mm, made me want to read more stuff like this. Then I picked up Tender is the Flesh by Augustina Basterica. So obviously I also tab this a lot. I really, really adored it. This is translated from Spanish. The author's from Argentina, and I've done like a super in-depth review about this, talking about uh, eating animals and the correlation between cannibalism. This basically follows this man who lives in a world. He works actually as like the he mm, works as a meat. 
This is what I mean. I'm not really good at talking about books. In this world, a virus has been spread among all animals, which makes them an inedible, unedible to humans and people have to get rid of their pets because this virus is really dangerous and after a while they basically start eating humans instead so obviously huge more trigger warning for cannibalism. This was fantastic. I think a lot of people don't love this because it's not exceptionally well written. It's not a perfect read. The language isn't perfect. The characters aren't perfect. There's nothing perfect about this whatsoever. But I think I just really, really love the conversation being had and the conversations that I created in my head from reading this. But it definitely could have explored more. The ending is fabulous. It's very much a dystopian, it, written in a classical dystopian way. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of horrific stuff here. So if you're like very specifically into or into not into certain type of body horror, I would uh, look up those trigger warnings because there's a lot. But I gave this five stars. I absolutely adored it. And both of the authors I read from Argentina this last month, and I love both of them. So I need to read more Argentinian authors. Maybe they have writing culture that I enjoy. Um, after that, I picked up How Are You Going to Explain This? Our Future on a Hot Earth by Jommer Mommers. So this is a dude from Netherlands. I actually don't know how he's qualified to write about this, but do you need to be qualified? I don't know. Oh, will the corona pandemic make it worse or better? So this is, I was interested in this because it's a sort of new release and it was written after corona. And I'm like very interested. This is such an awkward, what is this beanbag action? <laughs> Charm's lying here and he's being a cutie. Yes. How are we going to explain this? This was fantastic. I highly recommend the audiobook. I've just been really inspired by past story time lately because I feel like when they sit down and talk about books, they really take their time. And I want to try to inhibit those, inhabit those qualities more because I think I tend to want to be concise, but I'm not a concise person. So I'm just fighting against myself when I do that. If you've never read any climate change stuff, I think you should start here. Um, I mean, that's a bold statement to make considering I haven't read like that much nonfiction on climate change, but one, it's very, very adjustable. It, the language is super easy. It's not filled with facts. Uh, but and it's structured in a very adjustable, consumable way. It starts off telling you, uh, you us, how we came um, to this point in history, why we're experiencing climate change to this point. Oh wait, the copy, actually I read this as an audiobook, but I can see that the copy has like graphs and shit. Cool, maybe I should reread this. Um, it's almost like a little bit witty and at some times, uh, wow, there's many illustrations. I really do need to read this, reread this. And then the second part is where are we headed? And it, what this book illustrates really well is that he gives you these scenarios of this is a reality, this is a reality, this is a reality of like how it could go. And some of them are a bit extreme. Some of them are like, what if we can do this? And then this is the reality. And I found that was really helpful for me because I think we are taught when it comes to climate change to be driven by fear when it comes to how we relate to climate change it's very much fear driven motivations that we're supposed to be motivated by but not everyone's driven by fear i'm not driven by fear and illustrating these different futures that we could live in was really helpful for me because it made me lust or want and live in that world a sustainable world rather than not want to live live in this war wartime world and it's really interesting also how he talks about a world where we let climate change escalate is a world that's worse for everyone in so many ways like with war with famine um with I mean racism like everything is so connected and all of those things are will get worse unless we fix climate change so I just think it's uh it's really interesting and yeah I just highly recommend this one he also debunks certain myths about climate change so this is a great place to start some of them was a bit like yeah I know this already for me but I think this is a great place to start Ooh, then I listened to an audiobook this is disability visibility uh, edited by Alice Wong I absolutely love this. I've been trying to get my hands on a copy so I can like go through it and read certain stories again, but I found this so, so fantastic. I think it's a must read for everyone, especially if you're able-bodied. It uh, specifically also talks about the intersectionality between 
um, disability and transness, between disability and race, and all these different things, and I found that was like really, really great. In hindsight, the one that sticks with me, sticks with me the most is the one that, the bus experience that they were having, and it's like the one I'm thinking, I think about the mo most, and I'm like, how can we let this happen? But it also is like, horrible how I'm shocked by these experiences when they're common for disabled people and in my review on I do sometimes like do like one line review when I finish books because it's like the main thought I was having and what I felt with this one was I felt super super seen and understood in this book without the book have having nothing to do with me and I don't want to make it about me obviously in this video when I talk about it but I think it there's like you know we have these problems with like different social justice problems and I think few people understand that uh, the problem of the minorities are the problems of everyone because we're all affected by the struggles of disabled people because the beliefs are translated to able-bodied people and affect able-bodied people how we view ourselves how we view how efficient we are and um, how we you know like it's just I highly recommend it. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. It was so good. Amazing. And the introduction was narrated by Alice Wong herself, which is great. I know this is a podcast, which I'm interested to check out as well. After that, I read Axiom's End by Lindsay Ellis. So do I have thoughts about this? Let me just give me one. So this book follows our main character. Oh, it's 2007? <laughs> Okay, so it takes place in 2017 or 2007. This follows our main character, Cora, who, through a certain chain of events, ends up being the middle person communicator between this alien race and humanity. So, what happens is that she has split with her father and they don't get along. Um, and because her father is kind of involved with revealing a lot of things that the CIA are trying to cover up when it comes to the alien invasion and somehow she gets involved with it that has nothing to do with her father and things like really do escalate. There are many things about this book that I really adored. I really adored the aliens, how they communicate and the conversations that were being had around human and extraterrestrial life communication and also about how little we fucking are compared to like, you know, the history of the earth and the universe. Um, all in all though, this has a super, super, super strong beginning. So the beginning is just so action packed and you kind of expect the, the, that to continue. And I know a lot of people use action packed beginnings to like pull you into the story, but I feel like it couldn't live up to the rest of the story because it was so action packed that everything else felt really slow after that. And I felt like the action never really picked up again. So at the end, uh, towards the end, I was really, really wanting to finish the book. And I'm still, I think I gave it 3.5 stars, three stars, something like that. Um, yeah, three stars. I wasn't like thrilled about it, but it wasn't a rat bad reading experience either. It is super um, easily written. I don't know if easily written is even cr cr like grammatically correct. It is easy to read. And if you're looking for a like medium, Leaning towards YA sci-fi, maybe check this out. After that, I picked up The Art of Communicating, and I do not know how to say this person's name. Thichnat Han. This person, this guy, is a Buddhist, and I think he's written a lot of books about uh, mindfulness, and this book is specifically about communication, and I also listen to this as an audiobook. I didn't like this for, for two reasons. One, it kept saying like, oh, if she, her does this, or if the man and woman does this, and like, and it was just like all the time, like he or she did this, or he or she did this, or maybe you should comfort he or she this way. And I'm like, it was all the time. And at the end, I was just exhausted because like I couldn't get over like how ex excessive it was. Um, and I know like obviously this is written different culture, different age in a way. It's also very centered around Buddhism and it talks a lot about struggle and helping other people through struggle. 
it does give you some key phrases on how to communicate with more vulnerability and humility, but I think this was also very basic for me. And honestly, it didn't teach me all that much. It didn't remind me to be more mindful with how I talk and how I interact with the world and just staying mindful in the present. But it was pretty basic and I feel like I didn't learn all that much. Then let's talk about this book, The Seed. This was such a wild ride. Holy shit, by Chayna Porter. So this takes place in our world and all of a sudden there's this alien entity called the seep that pretty much infiltrates water and everything and it sort of starts taking over the world and creating this utopia where people ingest that ingest in seep the seep and it makes them euphoric and connected to the world and it's really like this utopia where everything is just perfect. And our main character, Trina. Yeah, capitalism falls, hierarchies and barriers are broken. If something can be imagined, it is possible. And it's so, it's so interesting because throughout this whole book, I was really, because Trina is going through this mental process of really struggling with not being perfect and not wanting to... Um, acclimate to this new seep reality and she feels like her struggles are valid and important and she wants to like live through those struggles and anyone who doesn't want to like submit is like not dealt with in a compassionate way but she's like no I want the resistance I want people to like talk back at me I want you know like the struggles of humanity I mean what is humanity without like the struggles that we have then we're just like spiritual beings you know I adored this. I gave it five stars. I thought it was fantastic, but throughout the whole book, I could not decide if I agree with Trina or if I like agreed with this utopia world because when the utopia world was described with the seep, I was like, wow, I want to live there because it eradicated like racism. It re eradicated so many things that we as humans have struggled to fix. When we like understand all people, then there is it like is no divide between people, between borders, um, any, anyone could become anything, there was no property. It was just like all these things that we struggle with, with fixed. And I was like, wow, that sounds so, so great. It basically cured climate change. Like it was just like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And I was like, wow, I really want some alien entity to just come in and, and save us from climate change. You know, actually that's like a lot of, we always think that's a lot of reasons why people don't do anything about climate change is literally because they think that someone else is going to save them from that fact but this was just really really good and i just like i was having all these thoughts and i still don't know if i agree with trina i love the human struggle but i also want the society to be like seep with a more exception of the humanity i don't know i found it very very interesting um but uh yeah trina's partner she's a trans woman and she is together with her girlfriend diva and diva wants to become a baby again and that's kind of like what sets off the plot in this book Ooh, then i listened to another audiobook i really got into queer memoirs this month this is we have always been here but samra habib so this is uh the book hub look book for Rainbow Readers, Rainbow Reads. This is like a Instagram book club, queer book club that I recommend you check out. And this was the book club for January. So this follows Samara as at a very young age, she moves from Pakistan to Canada or her family does. And you follow her growing up. Or actually don't really follow her. She's very much telling you the story. And when I was looking at the live show for this, they said that they felt very much like some and I was telling you what was happening rather than letting you in on the action and I didn't think about that whatsoever because I listened to it as an audiobook and it felt really really good to have the author like tell you about what was happening and it made me feel like we were having a conversation in a way so I recommend I really recommend listening to this as audiobook also because Habib like narrates it herself I thought it was really, really good. I find the intersectionality between being queer and being Muslim something I want to explore, and which I also did. I'll tell you about it. Um, I, I gave this four stars. It wasn't my favorite. There was some parts at the end where the author literally would just like, hey, those are my books, sweetie. Oh my God. Can't have anything lying on the floor these days. 
Towards the end, the author sort of like skimmed through these things that I felt like was really important, like the fact that she had her first like threesome and the fact that she like started doing all this art and photography censoring queer Muslim people, which I really want to know more about. And I wanted to write like a whole book about that because that was super interesting. Um, and I just felt like there was a lot of rush stuff happening at the end and it felt very much like uh, Habib hadn't really worked out those things, feelings and thoughts about her more current life rather than her past and like realizing she was queer. But it was a good, it was really good queer memoir. Then I did, I'll just talk about them quickly. Actually, let's talk about this one first. Life is a Unicorn by Amru al Qadi. So this is also a queer Muslim memoir. I also listened to this as an audiobook and Amru does narrate it as well. So I highly recommend consuming this as an audiobook as well. So this follows Amru growing up as a queer person in the UK. I felt like this was super, super impactful there was definitely some like really jarring explicit part because Amro doesn't shy away from telling you anything about their life um it huge trigger warning from islamophobia and especially internalized islamophobia um because Amro really much tries to really much tries to cure or take away the muslim and the iranian parts of themselves away and it's quite hard to read about, but I highly recommend it. This was phenomenal, fantastic. It kind of follows Amru through addiction and all their struggles. Just really, really recommend this. I feel like Amru has been through everything. <laughs> like everything this book could have possibly talked about when it came to queer issues, they talked about. Phenomenal. Amru's also uh, does drag, which, I haven't seen any of their drag photos or them in drag, uh, which I'm really excited about, but I just really, really highly recommend this one. Just so, so phenomenal. There are quite a few, um, what is it called? Triggers, so look that up. I would also put a trigger for self-harm. Hmm. Yes, homophobia, transphobia, all that stuff. Then I did my little, little reading vlog um, with these four books, and I think I'm just gonna tell you to go and watch that video if you want any more information on those, because I go quite in depth on these. You can just skip the parts where I cry endlessly about stuff. This is a new favorite, favorite Jane Rawson's Formaldehyde, five stars, just super, super amazing. Um, convenience store woman, like 2.5 stars by Sayaka Murata. The Last Children of Tokyo Yoko by Yoko Tawa Tawada. Really sad, but I give it four stars. I recommend this climate fiction. Then we have Remote Control by Nandi Okorafor. I also gave this um, five stars. I definitely want to read more of her stuff, um, like Venti. Really fun African futurism. Ooh, yes. I will talk about this quite in depth in my <sighs> zero waste for January video. So. We Are the Weather, Saving the Planet Begins at Jeff Breakfast by Jonathan Safran Foer. This book, I feel like this title and everything is just very badly marketed because when you read this, I think about how I can change my diet so we can change the weather is what I think this book is going to be about. It is very much about Safran working through a foer, working through his struggles and internal struggles when it comes to climate change, feeling paralyzed by the hugeness of it, the vastness of it, by the huge problem, knowing all the facts and still not doing enough, and him battling these inter internal thoughts and coming to terms with them, comparing climate change to a variety of different scenarios in our past in World War II, and trying to pretty much motivate himself, motivate other people, trying to figure out how he can know so much yet do so little um, and the future of his children and all that. So this is a very, very personal account of all those feelings. But if you're struggling with similar thoughts, I highly recommend checking this out. Very much the first 60 pages, he doesn't even address climate change whatsoever, but he just writes, like compares all these things in all these like mini essays. And it's very much written like these small essays, um, but it was very difficult to read at times. But the main message is that eating less meat 
is the number one thing um, you can do to help prevent climate change. And in the back, he also explains why eating meat is said to contribute 4.5% to climate change. And he argues why it's actually 51% and what those two numbers means. So check it out seriously. I don't know anything about the audiobook though. If that's how you want to consume it, I think that is also fantastic. Then I listened to another nonfiction audiobook. I've just been really, really enjoying my nonfiction audiobooks lately. Um, I feel like I'm learning so much, but it's really using my brain power. So this is uh, Lola Olafemi's um, Feminism Interrupted. I think it's called Disrupt Power. It's a new series of books being published. This is, was published recently, um, but it was so so fabulous this was this is my first book on like feminism i have never read any books on feminism and this was just really really an essential great place to start i think it blew my mind in many ways and it introduced me of a new way of thinking about feminism that i have never considered and never knew feminism could be um which is a bit sad but everything in this book i totally agree with she talks about feminism as justice work for everyone and how feminism connects to pretty much all social justice issues and issues we have in the world today. Here's what it says on the back. Plastered over t-shirts and tote bags, the word feminism has entered the mainstream and is fast becoming a popular slogan for our generation. But feminism isn't a commodity up for purchase. It is a weapon to fi for fight, fighting against injustice. This revolutionary book reclaims feminism from consumerism by exploring state violence against women, reproductive justice, mis as trans misogyny, sex work, gendered Islamophobia, and much more, showing that the struggle for gendered liberation is a struggle for justice, one that can transform the world for everyone. So I, I finished this and I was like, wow, this was so good. This is like a guidebook essential for feminists. But then I was like watching Sunny's video and they were talking about like all these other great nonfiction. I'm like, maybe my brain's very basic and it doesn't take much to impress me. But five stars, highly recommend it. The audiobook is good, but you can tell that it's been edited and there's another voice that adds certain sections. And I definitely did want to reread that one. We'll see if it's actually gonna happen though. Okay, then I also did a very in-depth review of these two books um, where I talked about every single short story in both of them. This is Haruki Murakami's After the Quake. It follows all these perspectives and their relationship to the earthquake that happened in Kobe. It was good. I liked it. Gave it four stars, I believe. They're all different stories, so if you want to know what the story's about, check out that video. Then we also have this one, Mouthful of Birds by Samantha Schweblin. This was incredibly jarring, and a lot of the stories made me incredibly uncomfortable because it really does like access those really uncomfortable feelings in you and makes you sit with them and you don't really like it, but you also love, love it. It's like torture porn. No, there are some like quite harsh realities when it comes to a lot of stuff. There's a lot of like animal harassment, abuse, but they're all fantastic. It's very speculative, really, really good short story collection. Samantha Schweblin is officially one of my favorite authors. I think I read all of her books that have been translated. Then I listened to another book that I don't have physically. This is The Story of More, How We Got to Climate Change and Where to Go From Here by Hope Jarin. So this is another nonfiction on climate change and I didn't particularly enjoy this one for two reasons. It is very demotivating and harsh and I feel that a lot of the books on climate change pretty much have the same messages and the same information, but some are very depressing like this one and some are more hopeful and believe in humanity, like um, how are we going to explain this, which I think is very hopeful, but they have the same information. So I think it's about choosing what works for you and reading the light, right climate nonfiction on climate change and this one I think was very much not for me. I felt like it was just trying to convince me that climate change was real, which I already know is real, and it was not informing me a lot on a lot of stuff. And maybe it was just like a more of a starter pack one and I just felt like I didn't learn much in it. Um, but yes, I've been seeing this meme go around saying that, uh, I think it's Elon Musk that posted like a tweet he will um, donate money for someone who um, 
for technology that's going to take away CO2 from the atmosphere and air. And there was this person, I think YouTuber just post like, oh, have you ever heard of trees or whatever? And this tweet or I think is awful because one, a lot of activists who don't know much about climate change will just throw this out. And even people who do know about climate change and read books also throw up because it's funny, but it's just spreading like a lot of inaccurate information. And this book like address that, how planting trees is not gonna save the planet. Um, and actually the ocean is like gives us more um, H2O or breathable air than forests do and that we should maybe also focus on like cleaning the ocean and not just plant more trees. Ch planting trees takes a lot of time and it's never gonna pay off in how quickly we need to solve this problem and this book also addresses the fact that we do in fact need um, technology even if we pretty much reach net zero in the next couple of years, which is not likely. Um, so I just found this to be great in the informative sense, but I find it depressing and it didn't seem like the author like wanted to, uh, didn't have much hope in humanity, let's just say it that way. And I just don't like to read books like that. So one more book to talk about, is that it? Oh no, we have two more books to talk about. I forgot I read this one. This is uh, Sorted, Growing Up, Coming Out, and Finding My Place, a transgender memoir by Jackson Bird. So apparently Jackson Bird is an um, trans YouTuber. And I got this audiobook recommendation from Chloe who had like an audiobook recommendations video. And I was just like, oh, a trans memoir. Could be cool, could be fun. So I listened to this one on audiobook and Bird also narrates it himself, which I really adored. And he just talks about his life growing up. It's very easily written. It really very much feels like he is telling you his life story in a very casual way. You can like see that or hear that he is practiced with telling the story and listening to his voice is fantastic. After I read this, I also went to his YouTube channel just to see what his content was like because he does make videos on being trans and his experience with that. And I found this to be good, but it's just, there was just some things, I think I was like, I'm feeling too vulnerable to read a book like this right now because what really hit me in this book, it's like, this is good. This book is good, okay? If you're interested in reading trans memoirs, like I recommend it. Um, I give it 3.5 stars though because I think it also perpetuates like a lot of, like it, many ways it's very stereotypical and I hate to say that because it's obviously like Jackson Bird is very true to his experience. Like there's no lying here. He's just telling his story and he's so valid in telling his story and so valid in sharing his spirit experience. And there's gonna be so many people who see themselves in him and feel so seen and love, love, love this story. But I feel like if you're not trans and you read this, um, I think you could have certain ideas about what being trans meant and um, just think that this was how he was for all trans people, which is obviously not on Jackson Bird, but everyone else reading the book. But I just want to put that thought out there. Generally, though, I feel like this book should have narrowed down who this book was for because I did not know if it was for himself, if it was for his family, if it was for trans people, or if it was for um, cis people. I feel like the book was written much more for cis people than it was for trans people because there was just like a lot of things that I felt like was really obvious and like he was explaining and just, yeah, I just felt like it was written for cis people. I don't know, it's just a vibe, you know, um, which I don't mind at all, but I just, don't really know what he was going for with this book. Maybe like he just wanted to tell his story and that's completely fine and valid, of course. Um, another thing that struck me about this book is as I, was, as I was reading it at the end, Jackson Bird said like, oh yeah, sometimes like it goes days without me even realizing um, I'm trans and how like, like now no one ever misgenders me, um, blah, 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 like after he's medically and physically transitioned and it like 
it hurt me a bit because it made me realize that, I mean, not he hurt me, but hearing that was a bit hard for me because it made me realize that as someone who doesn't want to medically transition and as someone who pro probably will always present feminine, um, I will always have to, like, I'll probably be misgendered my whole life. And seeing someone being able to reach a point where that barely happens to them um, was just kind of hard to read about. It just made me think all these things. And I think it was just like a lot for me to deal with in the, in the moment. Um, then the last book we're going to talk about, this video is exceptionally long, but I don't really care, is Down Days by Ilse Hugo. I picked this up because the cover is fucking rad. It takes place in this sort of South African future where there's this virus that a pandemic that's hit that basically makes people laugh and like nonstop and they can't stop laughing and eventually their insides turn to soup and they die. And you follow like multiple, multiple characters in this world that are affected by the new reality that they live in. Like they wear face masks, they have checkpoints where you have to get tested. Like it's just a pandemic. We, we're here, we know what it is about at this point. But this is just so much worse because the disease actually makes you die. And an interesting fact is also like it makes you uh, laugh first and then turn you die. So you can't really laugh either because it's a sign that you're sick even though, you know, people laugh, it's funny, shit's funny. Um, so you follow like a multiple characters I think a few of the perspectives could have been cut from this, but what um, starts the story off is that it's this young girl who has a little brother that gets kidnapped. Then you follow like a detective that decides to take on finding this little boy for free. And then you follow a third perspective of this guy who's looking for a woman with this beautiful hair that he's in love with. And he also deals uh, hair, because hair is also a commodity. In this world, I found this very compelling. I started off as an audiobook, but quickly realized that I was lost. So I went halfway through this book and had to start over basically and reading it physically. And I kind of wish I wouldn't have done that because it made the first half quite boring because I felt like a lot of it I had read, but at the same time, a lot of it I went right over my head. But I found this really entertaining. I think the ending was really, really good and it just really stuck with me and I felt like the author did a really good job of like creating this mystery where we didn't even know really what the mystery was. Um, there is like some few speculative elements of it, I think. Um, and it's a little bit weird because it takes place in this like sort of South African-ish town. And I've never been to South Africa, so I don't know what like environmental or phys what is it called? Uh, yeah, environmental stuff the author was explaining that was typical for uh, South Africa and what was caused by the pandemic happening, which would be interesting. So I would love to hear uh, some thoughts from someone who is South African or has been to South Africa after reading and reading this book. So yes, uh, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you like this more casual, casual, relaxed way of doing it. I'm so glad it's done. I'm sorry, like, this is what you get. But I don't know why I'm feeling so stressed about it. I think I just loved so, so many of these books. Like, these books were so good. Like, I know I read a lot of books, but I also loved, loved, loved a lot of books. Like, just adored them. So many new favorites. Someone asked me my favorite book of January, and I, like, could not even decide. Like, I just love these books so much. Obsessed. Like, I'm obsessed with so many of these books, and I think I felt, like, this pressure of wanting to do them justice but I will be able to talk about them in other settings as well, of course, but check out my graphic novel um, wrap up if you want something more eloquent. And thank you guys so much for watching, sticking by me during this rough patch. Mm, that's dry. So I'm sending all of you so much love. Take care of yourself, love yourself and your close ones. Spend time with your pets. Do what you enjoy. Don't be too hard on yourself. Am I telling this to myself? Yes, I am. And I wish you all the best. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.